Oh, shalom, my friends, shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am so thrilled. Look at that smile, that, that <laughs> million, multi million dollar smile that everybody has known for decades because I know you made me laugh, at Rabbi. Herman. What? What, what, what? I mean, what? Hello? Shalom? What? What did you say? I heard you. Oh, no, you're not muted. I just, you, you, I heard you saying, and then you were, I interrupted you because that's what I always do. But there you, you want to call him Herman? He's actually Peter, Peter Noon. Let me tell you something about this man. Herman's Hermits, the band he was originally in, sold 60 million records with great pop numbers, like I'm into something good. I'm Henry VIII, I am, da -da -da -da, silhouettes. Can't you hear my heart? Rabbi, I'll do the singing. <laughs> If you want to, if you want to spend a half hour just singing, I'll just sit back and listen. This would be lovely. <laughs> no, 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 no. But you started to sing. I'm Henry the Eighth, and you're not. I'm Henry the Eighth. You're, you're a rabbi. Well, or I could be Henry the Ninth. You never know. We could have had a Jewish son. These yeah, exactly. things happen. We don't talk about them, but they happen. But here's the deal. You can see Peter Noon talking to me now. But if you want to hear him sing, the real place to go is two different places if you're in and around New York. On Thursday night, March 31st, he will be at Sony Hall in Midtown Manhattan. Or, yes. you know what, if you don't want to go to New York, you don't want to get on the subway and get stabbed by a homeless guy. Wait until April 3rd. He will be at the Suffolk Theater in Riverhead, Long Island. But either way, we have with us in the neighborhood right now, Peter Noon Shalom! Rabbi Shalom. How are you? You look fantastic. How's life? How are things? You know, it's it's extraordinary, really, because, you know, we, there was there was a few years there where it got worse and worse and worse. Remember, we hit in California, we had a mudslide, then a fire. Or, I'm not sure what order it was in, but, you know, it was like the tempest and um, and rocks came down off the mountains and they weren't being carried by anybody. They were just rocks rolling down the mountain. Then we had a flood and then we had a mudslide and then we had everything. It was just and then we had a pandemic. Oh, yeah, and now, that. you know, I, I can't remember what was before the flood and the mudslide now because people just sort of move on from disaster to disaster, Locus, you know, so I think, was I've just been singing my songs, which are, you know, Rabbi, my songs were all uplifting, except for one, the end of the world, but most of them were uplifting, you know, woke up this morning feeling fine, something tells me I'm in something good, uh, you know, wonderful world. Um, no milk you know, today. Well, if you're no, like, they the were all, moment, that's good, but you know, there's a kind of hush all over the world. You know, there was a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of like up songs. So they seem to work better now than ever. Not cool. Then, although you are, you seem, are you living in your car or are you just in, in your car for a moment? I'm kidding, but I'm in my car. I'm, I'm in my car in um, a place called Ojai, where my agents are. They are, they have an office in Paris. It's called Paradise Artists, and they're living. Oh, they're in Ojai, and I came around. I came over here to meet them, and then I was reminded that I have to speak to Rabbi Shlomo, and and I, oh, so I called you from my cell phone in my car. And it's working beautifully, and it's fantastic, and it's delightful to see you. And and how? Let me ask you something. Look at this head. I lost my hair when I was four years old. How do you have such a? That's your real hair. How do you do it? This this could be a shaitel, you know. You never know. <laughs> Wait. How do you know these? Words? You never know. You know, what it what it is, is I think my dad had was like a, it was a trombone player in a band and he had long hair when no one had long hair. And it wasn't as long as this, but I think I inherited his hair. I didn't inherit his love of the trombone, but I do like hair. I'm glad I've got it, you know, but what I've found, uh, Rabbi, is that you should never, ever mention hair or weight if there's any bald or fat people in the room. Well, good luck. Then you never ever mention hair or weight because- There you go. With three people. Oh, I get it. You know, you know that's right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And then in terms of my sermons, uh, I shouldn't mention stupidity because just I'm surrounded. I, I, don't, I don't like to talk badly about my congregation, but I do. But this is about you, <laughs> Peter Noon. Let me, let me ask you, and let's get this out of the way because you've told this four million times. You probably should tell it four million and one. You got your nickname from, in a manner of speaking, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Just get it over yeah. with. Just tell us 
I know. Just okay, no, it's, it's, it's a nice story. Yeah. You know, it's, we, were, we were rehearsing in a pub in England, a public house, which served alcohol. And obviously we were too young to drink, but we were rehearsing there. And um, we were called Pete Novak and the Heartbeats. And I thought I did a pretty good job of Body Holly. And we were going to be like a Body Holly tribute band, even though there were no tribute. It hadn't been invented, that idea yet. But, you know, I put on these horn rim glasses, a bit better than these, a bit, bit more like yours. But I had hair and I wasn't as fat as you. But um, I... <laughs> I, I put these glasses on. I was going, what little things you say and do. I'm doing all that body holly stuff, you know. And the guy who owned the pub called Publican came over and he said, Ooh, what are you trying to do up there? I said, oh, look, <laughs> body holly. He said, you don't, you don't sound or look like body holly. You look like that Herman from the Bullwinkle show. And he meant Sherman and Professor Peabody, who were two characters. And the, there was a short, bespectacled kid, but the dog was smarter than him, as in real life. And um, everybody in the, the, the band, the Heartbeats, they were called, started to laugh like over the top laughter. And he said, and you're the Heartbeats? You should call yourselves the bloody hermits because you look like hermits dressed like hermits or something so that man created herman and the bloody hermits we dropped the bloody and eventually we became herman's hermits but that stayed and i still look a little bit like sherman from the professor peabody show you know an older version yeah, well let, let me uh, you know you brought up um you're in a pub uh, served by a publican there you go and and this idea though Ironically, on some level, I remember there was a story about you that they were so afraid of the image of the band that you had to flush like sing some Mia seeds down the toilet. And yet, ironically, you were so much less um, drugged or anything else than a lot of your cohorts in the 60s. So is, is this you know, I, is it true? Uh, yeah, but, you know, we were overeducated for the situation that we were put into. You know, we were all uh, we weren't really. Um, lower working class yobos, although we had to, you had to pretend to be, and and I think it's it's kind of significant that Mick Jagger also was overeducated for the 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 role he played of you know like a a Cockney vagabond, all all that stuff, and um, what happened was we we were still in school and we we decided that we would be ourselves. You know, we, were, we weren't going to be the sex pistols in, in the wrong clothes. We were going to be, you know, Peter Noon is Herman is Peter Noon. And Derek Leckenby was Derek Leckenby. He, his dad was a policeman. You know, Keith Topwood's dad was a telephone engineer. Uh, my dad was a, a trombone player who became an accountant because all trombone players need a, a, a full-time job. And, um, and, and we were all sort of very comfortable at being who we were. And that was kind of pretty, I mean, I think Derek Leckenby quit his last year at university, he was going to be civil engineer, um, to be in Herman's Hermits full time. And I quit school to be in Herman's Hermits full time. But I was, although I wasn't doing well at school, I was uh, a great student and I listened to the important stuff. You know, and, and, and in those, I went to a Jesuit kind of boys hard no school because my father thought they'd fix me up. You know, send us a boy and we'll send you back a man. Well, they sent in a boy and they got back a boy. <laughs> and um, and I, I stayed a boy for a long time, you know, and didn't grow up until I was maybe 40. Wait, let me you know, when right I had here. what what was the, the pivotal moment? What suddenly made you realize it was it having a kid? Was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When when my daughter was born, I, I decided that, you know, I'd better, you know, singing Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. It becomes less and less appropriate as you approach the age of 80. You know, now I've, I've lived, relived the 60s. I've lived the 60s twice in age and in thing. And I've the 70s and the 80s and 90s. And now I'm. You know, now it's even more difficult to sing Mrs. Brown and Got a Lovely Daughter, but I grew up and I realized that I wasn't 
the person in the song anymore. I was singing about the person in the song. And, um, you know, that, that, that works for me. The show got much better when I wasn't pretending to be uh, someone well, you, else. You, you, know? you, you were in, what was it, Pirates of Pensa? So you know what it is to, to play you playing Herman, playing you. It's just, you know, there's all these little layers that you can keep adding as you get older. I mean, that's, that's a cool thing, no? Well, yeah, you know, and, and, and of course, as I, over the years, when I, when I quit school, I did not quit learning. So, you know, I read books, and I read Stanislavski and the method and being living in the moment. And I read, you know, all that Harry Krishna and, and, I, and I constantly read and, and studied kind of because, because my nature. And uh, I, I think I grew, I got better at, at, as a person by, by listening to other people's version of what they think is reality. And, you know, in the end, I, I found out that you know, I'm just a, I'm a tourist, you know, I just love touring. I love to go to towns and, you know, I will know a lot more about that part of New York where, where the, the Sony room is after I played there, because I'll be a tourist. I'll wander around and I'll go in and out of shops and, you know, example here, I did, before I called you, I went for a little walk in this countryside here in Ohio, which is really beautiful. Wow. And, um, you know, I'm, 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 you know, they, humility is explained as um, being, having the ability to listen and learn. You know, I'm always ready for it. I'm not quite Mensa yet, you know, have been. When I was about 18, I was definitely Mensa product. But, you know, now I don't know. Used, used, I remember when my wife used to have Mensees, but that's very, very different. That's, uh, you know, thank God she's over that after all these years, let me tell you. <laughs> Mensum. Thank you. Thank you very much. So so speaking of all of listening and daughters, am, am I right about this, that well, you do still, first of all, have your show on Sirius XM, uh, like once a week you were doing a Saturday. You're still doing this. Can people hear it and listen? Oh, yeah. Yes, people can still hear it. Oh, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear. I'm sorry, oh. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I'm saying you still have your show on Sirius XM radio, do you? Yes, I do on Saturdays. It's very, very successful. And I enjoy doing it because I get to talk about my friends and about um, this period, a musical renaissance period where people that you would meet in a, in a nightclub in London all turned into becoming fantastic artists and songwriters and creative. You know, it was a, it was a, a very good period to have been a child in. You know, I was a kid. I was 16, 17, 18 during 64, 65, 66, when all that, you know, the Beatles and the Stones and the Dave Clark Five and Jerry and the Pacemakers. And a little known fact about England is that it's a very small country and we all kind of knew each other. We didn't necessarily like each other's music, but we liked each other because we were common. We had a common denominator that we all liked music and played it and earned a living playing music, which was like a dream come true for most people. And, um, you know, it, it's great. to I get to talk about it, you know, and I get to talk about Dave Clark Five and I get to, you know, and I, and I say this thing in the show that my mother told me, if I don't have something nice to say about somebody, don't say anything at all. So then I just play their record. Well, fair enough. Let's, is there so who who of those people of pe legends that we would know now that you came up with was your favorite as a chum? Maybe in like their music, but but the best person to hang out, the funniest times, the most enjoyable. You know, well, there's there's loads of them because you know if you're in a, if you're in a band and somebody else is in a band, you rarely are in the same town at the same time. Most of the people that I knew were not in the music business. Most of my friends were, I had a friend who was a journalist for the New Musical Express, which was a, you know, like Rolling Stone, but without any attitude. It was just kind to music. And, um, and he was my friend. And I had a friend who was a work for a movie company and he'd travel the world. And we'd sometimes, you know, we'd sometimes find ourselves in London. I, I like, I was a fan of the Beatles. So any chance I got to hang around with the Beatles, I would take it as an opportunity. And I was an enthusiast. So people would not really want me to be around because I was like a fan. 
and I, and I ex for example, I, I did a TV show with the Rolling Stones in Birmingham. And at the end of the TV show, I'm standing talking to Brian Jones, who was one of the nicer members of the Rolling Stones, nicer to me at the time. And um, at the end of the show, I saw them all leaving and I said, where, where are you guys going? Or where are you boys going? Whatever people, whatever was the phrase, where are you lads off to? And they looked at me like, oh, uh, we're going back to London. And I said, can I come with you? And I could see that they really did not want this 17 year old kid in the car with them, but they had to take me because I'd ask, oh, okay. And I got in the car and I sat in the front seat, of the car in the middle seat, like the, the child seat, a big American car. And uh, they took me back to London and we chatted all the way there. And they had a, a crazy driver who would break. He had a hammer that he would lean out of the, it was left-hand drive car. And he would lean out of the window with this hammer and break the, the wing mirrors off cars as we passed it. And all the Rolling Stones would go, yeah. And I'd be thinking, oh, oh I hope we're not going to pass my grandparents' car in a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, gosh. And, and that's, that was it. You know, like I, 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 the Beatles would be on a TV show and I'd go to their dressing room and try and hang out with them. You know, like, hey, fellas. Hey. <laughs> And I met that everybody changed, like though, that. I met Elvis Presley, and he was oh. fantastic. Elvis Presley was the most unlikely person to turn. He punked us. Elvis Presley punked us. We wow. went to, we went, he was in a Hawaiian village and he was making a movie, Hawaiian, Paradise Hawaiian style. And me and Barry, the drummer, we get in a car and it's five o'clock in the morning over all the mountains. And we come to what is known as Hawaii, a real Hawaiian village where people live in those beautiful grass huts and, you know, rock a hula, rock, rock. And, and we, they say he's in that hut over there. We go in the hut and there was this strange guy dressed but in completely drunk and down and, and dirty and laying face down in the soil. And we didn't know what to do because we were like, oh, my God, what do you, what do, you do? What do you do is standing around and, and, and in walks Elvis. And the guy on the floor is, gets up and it's his stunt double from the movie. And they all laugh at us because we fell for it 100. We didn't even know what a stunt double was. So we got completely punked. And... Um, you know, that's it's refreshing, you know, and, and I will tell you, Rabbi, that most of the people that I met that I liked before I met them, I liked them more after I met them. I liked Elvis Presley much more when I found out he was funny and smart and, you know, because they'd always played him as being some dumb truck driver, you know, doing real good. And he was really bright and funny, you know, and, and like not only the king of rock and roll, but also kind of the king of repartee which shocked us, you know, he had a good comeback line for everything that we said, like the Beatles, like that, that kind of speed thinking, comedy speed thinking. So, you know, I liked him, I liked John Lennon and John Lennon would buy me drinks when we'd go out together and stuff like that, even though I wasn't old enough. And, um, you know, it, it's, I was basically a fan of their, whatever they represented really, you know, he was a great, when I, when I first saw the Beatles in 1963, John Lennon was the lead singer of the band and the other guys were his backend group. Mm. I mean, it really was like that. So I, I watched him in the show and I saw his great um, energy with the others, like the way he shared moments with everybody and they laughed at, at each other on stage. And I, I sort of copied that in my band, that whole, I didn't have a guitar. So I used to hide behind the microphone stand and, um, and I, and I liked him generally. And remember, he, he became another person at the beginning. He was very, very good fun and, and very, very lively and a great amount of spirit. And I guess he listened to one Bob Dylan record and decided that he would be the Vox Pop. You know, and, and it was much more fun when he was kind of more arrogant. Oh, wow. Did you ever meet Dylan? Did you ever have any words with him? With John Lennon? No, did you Bob ever Dylan? Meet Dylan? Did you ever meet you ever meet Bob Dylan or no, Yeah, I met him a few times. You know, we went to see a band in in New York somewhere. And I think it was the New New Rascal, Young Rascals. And I was sitting on a table and it was John Lennon, Bob Dylan and Captain Beefheart. Oh my god. All, yes. All sitting on a table. And, you know, you could tell Bob Dylan didn't want to talk. 
he, he just he, he was very uncomfortable. He was very uncomfortable. And John Lennon wanted to talk to him. So I got Captain Beefheart and we just we enjoyed the band. You know, I mean, it, it's it's a weird thing. I'm still kind of put off by people who talk during somebody's performance. You know, you wouldn't do it. You know, I, I, it puts me off. I don't mind them shouting out and singing along and that's all great. Or in between the songs, shouting out and making me be a, a Don Rickles. But, you know, I don't think it's appropriate. You know, the, the, it was a presentation of this new band and I thought we should all be stum and listen to them until they finished what they were, had to say in the song and be impressed or not impressed and then applaud and then thank you by shutting up. You know what I mean? So, so, so it was a, Dylan, a weird night. Yeah, Bob Dylan was being the nice, he was being very respectful of the performer, whereas maybe Bob Beefheart and, and Lennon, not so much, right? Is that you know, I think I think Bob, I think John Lennon understood that as well because they came up the same way. The Beatles came up from the same place as me, you know. And and Bob Dylan did, you know, you're playing in clubs where people have got a, you want people to listen. We we did we used to do this place and the guy I remember the guy's name and I was because my dad was an accountant for some reason, even though I was only fifteen, I was sent to get the money. Who knows? why I would be the youngest person in the band, but I was the guy who managed the money. So I go to this guy's name was Bob Wooler. And, I, and, I, and he said, how much did I say I was giving you? So I said, six pounds, you know, it's just like $8, six pounds. And, and we needed the gig, it was the cavern, the engagement. And um, he said, I'm giving you four pounds. I said, well, we, we made a deal, six pounds. He said, yeah, but people were dancing. If people dance while you're on stage, then I could just play a record. Why do I need to play a band? I could just play, I could put the record on and people can dance. So we go, ooh, okay. So now we've got to get a show where people don't dance or they only dance for a bit and then you do a slot, then you do the end of the world and they have to stop dancing and just listen. And then you tell a story and they got to listen. And so, you know, the Beatles had come up the same way. And I'm sure Bob Dylan in those clubs in, in the village would have to ca capture people's attention. So then when you go and see a band whose job is trying to capture your attention, you remember how hard it is for that band to keep, to keep focus, keep the audience focused on you. What was, was you know, Mick pressure, Jagger runs around. Was there pressure on Herman's Hermits and you guys around 67, 68 to, to branch out, to be more psychedelic, to do concept albums of, of Sgt. Pepper yeah. and all that? He, yeah, everyone was doing it. But you remember a bit later, everyone did a disco album and a bit later, everybody, you know, we we just knew who we were. You know, it's it's really good. to. We didn't know where we were going. We had no plan, you know, like normally a band has a plan. We were we were like the Sex Pistols. We just we were living one day at a time and let's try and make hit records. Let's try and make hit records. And that's all we were doing. We just were, hit singles as well. You know, the album thing was never part of our. We never made an album. Our album was songs that didn't quite make it as singles. And then other people made them into singles. Like on our album, there'd be Bus Stop and the Hollies would have a number one with it and For Your Love and then the Yardbirds would have a number one with it. And it but our albums were just like, um, it didn't quite make it as a single. So let's put it on the album okay, with the say, singles. Uh, can I give you a compliment? And uh, I feel and we'll say this to anybody that the herman's hermits version of the song dandy is actually better than the kinks version and then the kinks friggin wrote it so that is, oh. that is i think pretty neat that's that's a, a bit of a crazy you know, guys yeah yeah i don't think their version is as good as mine either but but you know what happens is sometimes a song that isn't very good gets saved by the artist you know and there's multiple multiple versions of that and um well the rock and vickers do it really really well if you've ever heard them yeah yeah lemmy did it it's great it's funny that's that great. lemmy did yes. a version isn't lemmy it before motorhead that's right but yeah, yeah i think it's a pretty good song but it's just it's interesting that you actually outshone ray davis and the folks who, is everything okay are birds popping or attacking your car or what's going on over there is it oh I don't, my wife is just getting in the car i'm opening Hello, the door wife. so I'll let her in shalom wife there's my wife I oh, I don't quite see her yet, but we'll say a good. She's show. getting in there. She is. Hello, wife. I'm Rabbi Sal Solomon. What's your name? My name is Mireille. Mireille, oh French. Oh my goodness, we oui, we. Oui. Yeah. Or is she? She's or the only French girl. 
she's the only Spanish, French girl who can read um, Hebrew backwards. <laughs> That's the only way to read Hebrew because it, hey, hey, she so gets the she read? gets the book and she opens it at the back. Thank you. That's very funny. How how did you guys meet? Um, Either of you can. My ask wife. Them. Yeah. We both we both went to a nightclub where Jimi Hendrix was supposed to show up. She was visiting her mother in London, and we both ended up in a nightclub, and that's how we became. And we danced, and then we I followed her around the world to try and get her to marry me. And Jimi Hendrix never showed up that night. And he did. He did, yeah. And how was he? You saw Jimi Hendrix live. How was it? He was always great. He was a lovely man. He was a really nice guy. Yeah, very nice. People don't understand that, you know, sometimes people on stage aren't who they are in real life. He was a really nice, pleasant gentleman. Well, it's, I'm glad to hear. I'm not looking for horrible stories unless you want to tell one. Or, or if the person I don't have any. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear great stories about people that we we hear about or, or legends. We don't know them. We never saw them in the flesh. You did. And you hung with them sometimes, which is pretty amazing. So, yeah, I was lucky because, because, you know, I was a kid, remember? So people accept... They accept you in the room, you know, because they go, he's just a kid. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, he doesn't know he's not supposed to be here. I remember I went, I went to, I saw, I went to Paul McCartney's dressing room once on a TV show and he was in there talking to George Martin, who was the Beatles producer. And, and I, I walked into the dressing room, you know, I wasn't asked in, I just walked in and they were having a chat and they looked over at me like, okay, uh, hello. And, and I said, what are you guys talking about? And Paul McCartney, always the gentleman said, well, we're talking about compression. And to make the conversation carry on, I said, what's compression? And he said, he explained, he said, like on a Fats Domino record, when, he, when he's playing the piano and singing, you can't hear the piano, you can't, well, we're using compression so you can hear the guitar and the singer and the drums all at the same time, which is a good, ex so compressing waves. Yeah. And, uh, He's going on nicely. And then uh, George Martin looks at me and this show that they were doing was people who'd recorded a Beatles song. And it was Ella Fitzgerald and Matt Monroe and Henry Mancini and all those big shots. And George Martin said, um, which Beatles song have you recorded, Peter? And I go, oh, OK, see you later. <laughs> oh, well, OK. There you go. All it was right. a, the gentleman's way of getting me out of the room. Mm, all right. All right. Look, look, you know, you got to hang with him several times. Over. What can I ask you? What is the greatest concert that you ever saw as a fan? As just you saw I can Tina Turner, you, you saw like so many people who what blew your mind? You know, I was once on a show in at Wembley and I was on the show, but it can still blow your mind because all the other people on the show and once upon a time, a concert had like 20 different people on the show. You know, you could see Del Shannon and Bobby V and I can Tina Turner and Fats Domino and it, they would all be on a bill and they'd all come out and do 10 minutes, right? And I did a show at Wembley with the Beatles, the Stones, the Yardbirds, the Kinks, uh, the Searchers, uh, Cliff Richards and the Shadows. And we all watched each other. We all stood at the back and watched each other go on stage and, you know, did that thing. Oh, I bet he's got, I bet he owns the van and all that stuff that bands do, you know, bitchy stuff. <laughs> and, um, and eventually when uh, it was my turn to say something schneid about something and, and, uh, and John Lennon leaned, leaned over and said, careful Herman, you're on next. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was. Wow. We're talking yeah. with Peter Noon. Now, Peter, you're, you're obviously you're getting ready to go somewhere. I don't know where, where, where you're taking um, your lovely wife to. And by the way, she's in the, well, you're like the chauffeur. Why, why is she well, I am the chauffeur to... today. Yeah. But... She, she says, I drive too fast, so she sits in the back. You're smart, wise, wise woman. Is yeah. your daughter, does she do also the serious? Natalie, is that your kid? And does she? No, that's my daughter. daughter. Right. That's my daughter, Natalie. And she's got a She show does a good on. job, huh? Yeah, well done. Yeah. And and we can hear her on Sirius XM also doing a 60s show. On yes. Sundays. Yeah, on Sunday 60s show. Yeah, she she tells this 
the 60s from the from the eyes and ears of a young, much younger person, which is kind of an interesting concept, you know, because how do you get young people to listen to 60s on six? You have the songs presented by younger people who discover them. I think I think that's their idea. Well, where is, you know, they have lots of good ideas over there. Where's her taste in relation to yours? Do you like the same things? Does she go for completely different, you know, strawberry alarm? Nah. Yeah. Her, her first her first record was Nirvana. So, you know, it's a different, different world, but she appreciates, you know, she sometimes listens to songs and hears them for the first time, you know, on her show. You know, some of them she's heard in the background of, of, of her life, you know, played by me and, you know, my, my record collection. But some of the songs she's never heard before. Well, what are you listening so, to these days? What, what's on your, your listening device? What do you cue up? What might surprise us that you listen to? You know, uh, it, it's all over the place, really, Rabbi. You know, I, I, my wife doesn't like it, but I like Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. And I like uh, ZZ Top. And we all like the Rolling Stones. And I like the Beatles and I like a lot of Paul McCartney solo stuff. And, um, you know, I, I like people that I grew up with in the same ether, you know, the same mist. Like, so I like ZZ Top because I get it. Makes me laugh and, and stuff like that, you know, that, okay. that macho bravado world. And, um, you know, we see my group, we always played against that macho thing. We played the opposite of that because the Stones were doing all that jumping around. And it. we said, we're not going to do that. We're going to be, you know, cute little choir boys standing behind our microphone stands, dressed in suits. And it's the reason, perhaps, that you have lasted so long in our memories. If you had gone trashy, if you changed your hairstyle, if you gotten like to be bad boys, we might have forgotten Herman's Hermits, but there's a certain time capsule quality, not to mention that the songs are really catchy and really well done, that, that I think has kept you doing what you do. And, and people go, oh, of course, we love Herman's Hermits. You know? Well, you know what? Yeah, you know what, right? right uh, what somebody said, like at the beginning of my career, was when you hear a record, you need to be able to see the person's face. That is what a career is made of. You hear the record and you see the face. And I think when, like the new Hermit, the guys who are in Herman's Hermits now, you know, that Derek Leckenby died, so he's not in the new Hermits. So his replacement has to dress as if, as if it's 1965 on the Ed Sullivan show. Because that's the visual that people have well, when they you, hear the record. Do you feel you have to? I mean, you've still got the hair, so basically, all you have to do is just comb your hair, and you know, you're Peter, you're or you're Herman, you're it. You don't have to really, or do you? Well, I do. You know, I, I don't think it would be. I don't think people would be happy to see Herman up there in a pair of jeans with a ripped knee and a, a t-shirt saying uh, Che Guevara or something ridiculous. So I dress as if I'm going to work. It's always my job. Remember being Herman It's my job. I've had the same job for since 1963 or something. So, you know, it'd be, it'd be tough to change the rules. You know, we clock in, we're always in the dressing room ready to go one hour before the show. And it's just that kind of a job. We work in class people who manage to get paid. Well, before I let you go, because I know I'm keeping you and your wife from, from wherever you're chauffeuring her to, and I, I'm so grateful for Peter Noon being with us in the neighborhood. I have one last question, but before I get to it, I do want to remind everybody to go see him live in person singing on Thursday, March 31st at Sony Hall in Midtown Manhattan, and also on Long Island just a couple of days later, April 3rd at the Suffolk Theater in Riverhead, Long Island. Go to peternoon.com, and it's noon spelled like no one, not like the hour thing, or hermanshermits.com. There's even, you even have like a fan club. You can be a member of things. You can buy memorabilia and tchotchkes. Get lots of Peter Noon tchotchkes. Get them, folks. My question, though, <laughs> I love theater, I love Broadway. Do you have any fun stories from doing Pirates of Penzance for like two or three years? Well, you know something, I, I, it was a great growing period for me. There were people in it that were absolutely like mind blowing performances. Tony Azito, remember Murray? And, and, and the guy who played the modern major general, Mr. Rose, an English guy. Oh, George I mean, Rose, yeah. 
I learned, yeah, George Rose, I learned so much stuff from, you know, people taking care of each other on stage. You know, if somebody wasn't, it was like the Marines. It was like being in the Royal Marines. You know, if you missed, made a mistake, someone was there to back you up and everything. And all that I learned from that. I, when I was a kid, I was in Coronation Street, which is a, a, a live television show, um, live. And, and I learned most of my stuff then. You know, like if you if you miss a line, somebody can somebody really intelligent and clever will fix it for you. Another the, the camera will never have to flutter. And um, they were they were just brilliant. And I, and I had fun because it was me I, when I got to Broadway, it was me and Jim Belushi. And he was a character. He never did the same show twice. And it was just every day was fun. And I loved it every minute of it every minute of that Broadway thing. I love showing up at the theater and that Mrs. Minskoff had made everybody have a dressing room with windows because she'd been a dancer and been stuck in some dungeon somewhere. And all that tradition of Broadway was like, and, and after, after that, I went to England and did it on the West End. And it was all the same thing at the Garrick Theatre, you know, with the tradition of people taking care of each other and like a, like a real union. You know, the musicians union and the actors union are kind of similar. We've got to take care of each other. So I, I, I enjoyed the fact that everybody in it was incredibly talented. And when, and when the pandemic started, my first thought was, oh, imagine you just rehearsed for a show and it's opening on Broadway. And you've, you've been all your life, you've been dreaming of this opening night on Broadway and suddenly they close it and you've rehearsed for two months for nothing. And, and then it goes for more than a year. And then you've lost the opportunity and the theory. Oh, that's all I thought about was how much people in the entertainment business would be destroyed by it. Not, not just health wise, but, you know, never be able to recover that moment in their lives. It's like two lost years from their lives. Although the extraordinary thing about Broadway is that I think virtually every single show that was set to open just before the pandemic, eventually found its way back. Even Hangman, which wasn't supposed to, uh, you know, which died. It's a, it's a Martin McDonough play that, you know, the, oh, it's not going to happen. And, and, and the minutes by uh, Tracy Letts, suddenly they're all there. They're all, every single one of them managed two years later to come back. It's pretty amazing. Well, that's what, if you ask that's what I'm saying. But if you were a dancer it opening in a show uh, in a March 19, 2019, you may be not as good a dancer now. True. And you, as you said, I'm not much of a singer at this point. Oh, I, I, I sounded like Elizabeth Schwarzkopf two years ago. And now I sound like well, you, you. It's very sad. It's, you, uh, you were never a good dancer either. No, oh, sir. No, I can't even move these. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Peter Noom, it has been so delightful, so joyful, so wonderful. Last question, I promise. Last question. Advice for up and coming performers or just the whole world of getting through the next year when everything is going on? Um, the persistent people always win. I like it. That's a persistent, you know, I think you've got to stick at it. If you find something that, that gives you, don't let people talk you out of it. If I'd have done everything I've been told when I was a kid, I would never have had a life. I would have been a, an accountant. I would have been an accountant in a little shop in Manchester. And I, I would have probably been happy but I, I was persistent. I made, I wanted to do this thing that I do. And I, and you know, I wanted to be on Broadway and do you know, I quit Herman's Hermits to go on Broadway. And then I found out I couldn't pass the auditions because I wasn't good enough. So I had to persist and take lessons, singing lessons, dancing lessons, ballet lessons, every lesson, or even sword fencing lessons so that I could get on Broadway. And I was a persistent little chip. I persisted, persisted, because what else do I need to do? What else do I have to get good at? I even auditioned for Lab OM, like an, like an you know. Okay. I took, I, I took opera singing lessons to, so I could audition with Linda Ronstadt in Lab OM. Obviously, a much better singer than me, got it, but I, was, I, persisted, I worked for a year, every day, four or five hours a day, trying to get my voice, for skipping the, some people have natural ability part. <laughs> I thought no, I could teach I, myself. Well, yeah, but good for you. I mean, whatever you learned, even if you didn't get into La Boheme, it, it still stood, stood you in good stead as a singer overall for doing concerts and keeping your voice good so that you can still sing now for 90 minutes or, you know, an hour and 45 Yeah, minutes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, they, and, they taught me that on Broadway. 
that's I learned that on Broadway, warming up and stuff like that. That was that's that's another part of what I learned on the way. But you know, if you I think persistence is the key because. You know, when when we first started, we drove around in a van and there were six people in, in this little van that delivered cow heels and tripe in the daytime and pork pies. And, wow. and we drove around in this horrible thing for years. Everybody thinks we made it overnight, overnight sensation. But we, we had a dream and we stuck to it. We said, if we keep, you know, I saw the Beatles in a field and the guy I was with, it was so good that the, the guy who I was standing next to quit. He quit the business. He never, ever picked up his guitar again. But I, I, I'm going to practice a lot more and get better at this. And I want to one day be like that. You know what I mean? Some people persistent. quit. Yeah. And yeah, I was a persistent little chip. And, and they told me that at school, you know, keep the day job. Everybody was, you know, because I wouldn't show up for school. You know, I was in a band and we'd get home at 4 a.m. And I'd tell, I live with my grandparents and I'd say, uh, you know, can I, can I stay in bed? To, and, you know, your grandparents are easy. They were deaf anyway. They didn't know what I was saying. So, you know, I skipped school a lot, but I always got the work in. You know, if I'd get the homework done and show up and apparently seem to know everything. I was a little Noel. Well, it has paid off. Your persistence, I, I can't yeah. say that I would recommend your course of action to junior high school students, but it worked for you and it continues yeah, to work. Don't, no, don't, 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 but, but if you're a junior high school person, what you've got to do is not have, not have a, a part-time thing. You work on something that you want to do really, really, really hard, as well as doing all the schoolwork. I always did all the schoolwork. You were not allowed not to do schoolwork in my time. No, now either really not you're allowed not, not allowed to, 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 to not graduate and no know. but i mean I, i'm not saying don't do the schoolwork, but if you've got a dream and, you, and it's being in a band or being an actor or being being a german sing german opera that is awesome. you know there dream. isn't a market for that but you've got to persist at it until you until you make it into a market you think there were you think there wasn't any competition for a so-called beat group when we started we just had to get going we kept going and you, Peter Noon, you keep going, persisting with your talent, with your joie de vivre, and your-, your 10 more years. With that word, there we go. So I wanna thank both of you, certainly, Mireille, and of course, Peter, hello, Mireille again. Um, shalom, much success, much luck. Everybody go see Peter Noon on at Sony Hall on March 31st, Thursday night, and also Sunday night, April 3rd, at the Suffolk Theater in Riverhead, health, success, so much more music and mazel to you, Peter Noon. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Rabbi. I wish I could say something in Hebrew. What can I say? Kulam Whoa. Yes. All together. I love that. What? Kulam yeah. My wife is going to say something. How do you how do you know these were both of you? What, she you grew think? up in Israel, that's why. Oh my god, I shouldn't have talked to you. I should have talked to her the whole time. What a waste. <laughs> oh, damn it. I'm sorry. She's never taught me how to speak Hebrew because I was busy learning to speak French and English. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, just but say I can say uh, Titradesh. Titradesh. Yeah. And Titrachi. Oh. And uh, hey, you know what? I hope Lehitra ought. Ask her what I that knew is. that. Uh, that Pardon? Oh, a bientôt. Abianto. Oh. Abianto is French. No, I know, but uh, see you soon. See you soon, Abianto. Thank you, and shalom to you both. Thank you. Uh, you didn't say goodbye to the dog. Oh, shalom, Kelev. Where are you? Oh, well, they're sleeping. There she is. I'll be quiet. Kelev. Kelev. <laughs> okay, Rabbi, it's good talking to you. You too. Shalom Bye. and wolf. Have a great life. You too. God bless. Thank you. God bless you too.